Thank you, Joe. So good evening. It's been a, been a great 60-plus uh, hours. Um, this is only my third College of Chapters, but I must say, based on my own evaluation, I think it's the best one, and I'm very proud of how hard you've all worked. And speaking of hard work, I'd like to, and I'm going to ask you to hold your applause a minute, I'd like to ask all the brothers that served as faculty to please stand up. Okay, let's give him a hand anyway. <laughs> Remain standing. Remain standing. Brad Beecham, to you and your staff, please stand. The whole staff, what a great bunch of guys, hard work. And give them a hand. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Come on. And reach out and find two brothers and give them a high five. <laughs> Good work. Good work, good work. A lot of positive energy. Um, before I get into my, the meat of my comments tonight, um, I really thought it'd be appropriate, I know some of you have probably heard these numbers before, but to point out the power of the Greek system in this country, and I guess in some cases in Canada. There are 8,000, excuse me, 800 college campuses in America with 5,600 uh, Greek chapters and 305,000 active participants today. That would be men and women that are active uh, in colleges and universities around the country. There's no doubt that the Greek legacy is deep and wide, and I'm sure these numbers change from time to time, but roughly 50% of all um, Fortune 500 CEOs came out of the Greek system, big number. 42% of the U.S. Senate. 44% of American presidents, 31% of Supreme Court justices, and for sure two generals, right? Um, so anyway, I just point that out because, you know, we're Sigma Nu, but we're part of a much bigger organization. I, I'm very optimistic about the future of, of, of Greek life. I think that Sigma Nu is leading the way as a great example of how to do it right. And I think College of Chapters is the, 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 the way we uh, connect and become a role model for the rest of the Greek system. As you, I think you're aware every uh, year, excuse me, every other year, because we have Grand Chapter every year, when the new regents uh, inducted every other year, we convene as a high council and revisit uh, the plan that had been agreed upon by the, the uh, last High Council. And um, one thing that was so great about working with Robert Durham, and, and for the most part, very much the same High Council, except for the uh, collegians, was that we really were aligned. Um, and we spent a lot of time together, had homes in Atlanta together, and he did such a great job, as did Joe Gilman, uh, you know, getting us headed in the right direction so when it came time for us to reevaluate and revisit the uh, strategic imperatives, it wasn't that hard of a work, a work. We really did it in one day. The strategic imperatives didn't change, but some of the action items behind them did. We wanted to give them a little more clarity. And so I encourage you, we've been talking about the strategic imperatives all week, but I just have to, um, to repeat them. And the reason for this is it, that I really wanted to repeat them is because it became clear to me as we were interviewing the uh, candidates for the High Council that they all had different views of which one was most important. And the reality of it is they're all important. Uh, you know, the first one is chapter strength. That's the imperative. The action item behind it is Signu will assist its chapters in achieving organizational excellence. Excellence through education. Signu will assist its members in ethical leadership development and achieving personal growth. Alumni engagement. Sigma Nu will identify and engage alumni to support the success of chapters, develop per perpetual 
uh, fraternal leadership and increase the value of lifetime membership. Recruitment, Sigma Nu will consistently increase its membership through an innovative values-based uh, recruitment program. And reputation, Sigma Nu will preserve and further its reputation as an organization uh, devoted to excellence. And so, you know, as you think about this, we, we say chapter strength is, is the most important, but the way you achieve chapter strength is you have to get all the other items right. So if you have a good reputation, you're off to a good start. If you don't, you have to work on it. If you are recruiting good, that's great. That'll help you engage your alumni. That'll help you focus on education, and that will result in chapter strength. So chapter strength, while it's the most important, at least we believe it is, it's a result of getting the other uh, imperatives right. So it's kind of like a circle. You just keep, and what you do is every time you go around it, you get better. And I think that's what the College of Chapters is clearly about, getting better. Uh, when you arrived here in St. Louis, I guess you probably got my little quote, quote book, which is now 12 years old. I wrote it right on my 50th birthday. And uh, it's kind of funny how this happened. I was in the Mediterranean on vacation for my 50th birthday. And I got so bored that I decided to reread my own books, which means I was really bored. So, so I took him to the beach and I said, there's nothing else to do here. So I got a highlighter and I said, I'm just going to go through and read my books, which you can read them both in about an hour. The first one I wrote in 1995, which by the way, talks quite a bit about Sigma Nu called Idle Time, Turnaround Secrets. And then in uh, 98, I wrote Mapping Your Legacy, A Hook It Up Journey. And so anyway, I decided to get a highlighter and just go, go through and just highlight anything that I said in the books that uh, was original. And for some crazy reason, it turned out to be 84 quotes. And so I thought, well, that's good. I'll, make a, I'll write a book called 84 Quotes. So I, I did, and I published it, and it, I've been giving these things away for years, and it's, I think it's in its sixth printing. And uh, so anyway, if you have a chance, take, take a look at it. But what I decided to do tonight was take the uh, seven quotes out of the book and use those as examples for what I think Sigma Nu is all about. And if you happen to read the first page in the little book, which, you, by the way, you can read it in about seven or eight minutes, which I know everybody likes quick stuff, um, I use the word values as an acronym for vision, purpose, accountability, consistency, commitment, uh, sustainability, and goals. So I used that acronym, and when I, when I ordered the quotes, I put, I put the quotes under vision that I thought really represented vision, put the quotes under accountability that I thought represented accountability. So let's start with vision. And by some crazy number, it happens to be quote number one. And it goes like this, and I think you'll see it on the screen. In order to create a viable vision, you must first answer one very fundamental question, what do I really want? And, you know, that's a big one for me. Um, I think vision starts with forming good habits, um, health, hygiene. I remember um, being a, a candidate at Epsilon Epsilon, and we were very disciplined about cleaning the house, about keeping our rooms clean, all the blue shirts went together, all the white shirts went together. If the closet was big enough, there was one finger between each of them. And it was very military, very organized, and a good habit to form. Elevate your spirituality and hang around the right people. Those are some ways that will help you start to create a vision because your vision is going to come from who you hang around. It's going to come from who influences you. If you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a lawyer, you have to find if you want to be a coach, if you want to be whatever you want to be, you have to find that through other people and relationships. Purpose. What organizations need is a mutually agreed upon set of reasons as to why they're going to connect as individuals, form a team, make a difference in their personal and professional lives. This is an easy one, guy. guys. This is the creed of Sigma Nu. To believe, let's repeat it if we can. To believe in a life of love, to walk in the way of honor, to serve in the light of truth. This is the life, the way, and the light of Sigma Nu. This is the creed of our fraternity. I think it's our purpose. 
I think that's the purpose of Sigma Nu. And I think it's the only creed that has the word love in it, uh, which I think is one of the things that attracted me so much to Sigma Nu. Accountability, we often find ourselves in situations where we clearly know what's right and, and simply don't have the guts to step up to the plate and make the right choices. Um, life's about choices, and there's always a price to pay for a bad choice. There's not always a reward for a good one, but there's always a price to pay for a bad choice. That price might come in the afterlife, uh, but you will pay it. And it just takes one bad choice to really mess up your life. And so think about that. Um, hazing is an example of a bad choice. Alcohol abuse is an example of a bad choice. Don't do it. Um, Sigma Nu, as you know, we all know we've talked about it for three days. We're the only fraternity founded on anti-hazing. So let's honor our founders and think about them. Don't do it. Role models don't sing mixed, mixed messages between what they say and how they behave. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, easy to form bad habits. It's very difficult to form good ones. I'm told it takes 21 days to form a habit. I, sp I think that's good habits. I don't know how long it takes to form a bad one. But I think consisten consistency is um, best described through goal setting. And just a little tip on how I run my life, and I got this from the guy that hired me out of college, Bud Serotine. I keep a tablet. It's yellow. It's been yellow for 44 years. And uh, I have a list, A, B, and C. And A is what I got to get done for the day. B is what I got to get done for the week, maybe the month. And C is what I got to get done for the year or long term. So B and C lists seldom get, you, know, you have your list. By the way, if you ever have a list, I'm sure you all have lists. But anyway, you should have a list if you don't. But if you do, have you ever realized you didn't write it on your list, and so you already did it, and you write it down to scratch it off? I hope if you have a list, you do that, because I do it. But, you know, it's funny about writing, writing goals down. I have a quote that's in the book. What the mind can believe and conceive and write down, it can't achieve. And this is a very important, simple tip. We don't write anymore. We don't use handwriting like we used to. It's a different world. When you write something down in your own handwriting, particularly a goal, then if you show it to someone that respects you and you respect and make a commitment, I'm going to do this. Maybe like Cindy said, well, I'm going to lose some weight. So write it down. She said, get out of here. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, but in all seriousness, the, the idea of goal setting um, and having an A, B, and C list, and what I do on my A list, let's say I have 10 items. If I get five of them done, I recopy them that night. So that means I got to get it done the next day or the next day. So every time you rewrite something, it burns it into your brain and makes you more accountable. Just a thought that's how I run my life, and it's, uh, it keeps you organized. Commitment. We're going on a journey. This is the quote I get the most feedback on. The generals were great examples. We're going on a journey. We'll carry the wounded, but we're not going to wait on the stragglers. Um, that quote really reminds me of <laughs> hearing Lou Holtz speak a few years ago. And uh, he's really a funny speaker. He has a lisp, as you probably know. And he said, you know, there's three questions that um, every husband should ask of every wife or every boyfriend or girlfriend. I guess that's a good example. Every coach of every player, uh, every brother of every brother. And the three questions are, can I trust you? Are you committed? And do you care about me? And I heard him speak, and I think it was 1987. And so I'll tell you a little story that clearly doesn't require notes. It's kind of a Jerry Field story. Uh, I, I never started a company. Well, I actually did start a company three years ago, but in the early part of my career, I was a turnaround guy. That's what I was known for, going into troubled companies. And so I, I, had to, um, I won't go through the details, but in 1987, there was an article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, April 7th, 1987, and it said, um, Collins and Aikman floor covering, a division of Wix, announced today that it may have shipped up to $360 million of faulty carpet over the last 10 years. 
and eight senior executives have been sent home pending criminal investigation for the alter alteration of flammability data. And their three largest customers are IBM, um, the federal government, and the Mormon Church. Now, I don't know how you feel about that. I wasn't the CEO. Uh, he, he never went to jail, but he died, died you know, young. Uh, never got prosecuted. But anyway, I had sold a company, actually taken it public and sold out, a company called Carriage Industries, now owned by Shaw Industries, now owned by Warren Buffett. And by the way, still doing well. And um, I was goofing around, and I got a call from a headhunter, and they said we had this CEO position open in Dalton, Georgia, with a company called Collins and Aikman. I said, aren't those the guys that are in the Wall Street Journal? He said, yeah, but it's not that bad of a deal. You know, it's, it looks worse than it is. And our kids were at the point where I really didn't want to move them. We lived in Chattanooga. The carpet industry is centered around Dalton, Georgia. 80% of all the carpet made in the world, I mean, excuse me, the United States is made in Dalton. And that was my background. Uh, I actually was, ran four different carpet companies. So anyway, I talked to them and, you know, um, I really wasn't interested, but you know, I thought, you know, this is, this is really bad. And I tell you, this was only a $100 million company, but they were successfully losing uh, $2 million uh, a month. And you know, that's quite, that's, you know, that's, it's hard to lose that much. We, you know, we took the weekends off from losing money, so I never calculated it by the day, but losing $2 million a month on roughly you know, $100 million of sales, $24 million a year, you can't do that. I mean, so what had happened is they had, um, in the carpet, you, if you want to pass a smoke density test, you, you um, have to put aluminum trihydrate in the backing formula, and that lowers the smoke density. But what they were doing is they were putting the aluminum trihydrate in the, in the lab test, but when the actual production, they, weren't, they were cutting the viscosity back to save cost. And they got caught by a Florida school district, and everything blew up. And so anyway, I took the job. Uh, two months later, I took the job. And it was a new segment of the industry I hadn't been in. And I called the top team in, the ones that survived. And I said, look, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I'm the new kid. In fact, one of the funny stories, I, about a week before I got there, someone called in. Because the company had stopped shipping about half of the product lines because of this failure. Some lady called in and said, I want to talk to the president. And the switchboard operator said, we ain't got no president. So they did then. I showed up. So called the team in. Um, long story short, we, we returned the company to profitability in 16 months. Uh, the, the corporate had written us off. They, they, you know, they were, I thought they were going to pull the plug any day. But I was actually hired by a guy named Sandy Siegeloff, who was the chairman of Vic, Wix. And I said, look, I'm not going to do this unless a, I want a contract, which they gave me, and two, if you ever want to sell the company, I want to have a right of first refusal. So they gave me a letter, and we went along. We started to make a little money. And as soon as we started to make money, the new owners, Wasserstein, Perel, and Blackstone, decided to sell it. So they sent a guy to Dalton, Georgia, and they said, called me in and said, look, uh, we've decided we want to sell the company. You've done a really good job getting it to break even. And, uh, I said, okay. I said, I think it's a really bad mistake. I said, because we're fixing to knock the cover off the ball. He said, well, that's what we've decided to do. And I said, okay, well, great. I want to be a buyer. He said, well, you can't do that. I said, well, I can't do it. I've got a letter right here in my file. Sandy Siegeloff gave me this letter, said I had a right of first refusal. And uh, he said, well, he's not here anymore. I said, no, but he was the chairman of Wix. He said, well, you can't be a buyer. I said, okay. So um, I called my team into. Uh, the boardroom, this guy's name was Randy, Was um, Randy Wasserstein. No, Randy, yeah, Randy Wasserstein. So I called my team. Well, they, he, we called the team in, and he announced that we were going to sell the company. So I said, okay, you guys got it. So I took him out in the hallway. I said, guys, look, this thing's fixing to turn. I got a great idea. We're all going to quit. What? I said, we're all going to quit. This is the head of HR, the head of manufacturing, the CFO, me, uh, two other guys, head of labs or whatever. These guys had mortgages, kids, they're in their 40s. I said, look, trust me, I'm committed, I care about you, I'll take care of you. Are you guys in? They go, I guess. So, so I walked back in, I said, Randy, um, 
I know you want to write a selling document. I said, but uh, we're all going to be at home because we all quit. And so when you get that document ready, call us up and, you know, we'll be a buyer. If you don't want us to be a buyer, that's fine. We quit. He goes, you know, this has never come up before. I said, well, that's interesting. What do you want to do? He said, well, I'll be back in a few minutes. Well, he's gone two hours. When he came back, he said, you know what? We decided to make an exception. We're going to let you guys stay. I said, great. I said, now we'll get down to business. I said, can I be a buyer? Yes, you can. I said, great. So anyway, I raised $55 million. Excuse me, I raised $42 million to buy the company. They sold it for 55. Uh, it sold last year for 450 million. Uh, it's been sold three times. It's the only remaining business in Collins and Aikman, and they're making about 45 to 50 million dollars a year on about 300 million. So, and I made almost nothing out of it, by the way, because I was later hired away by Interface, their biggest competitor. But when it comes to, you know, sometimes you just have to stand by your team, and, and they did it for me that day, and I'll never forget it. Sustainability, true leaders spend their time nurturing other leaders. Um, you know, that's to me all about recruitment, and in order to be sustainable, we have to recruit. Um, you know, examples of the power of one, you can look at sports, you can look at RG3 or Peyton Manning, or you can look at men in this room or other men, brothers that are not in this room, that have almost single-handedly resurrected a, a chapter that was either, you know, gone or in deep trouble. And we have numerous examples of, uh, I mean, at Texas Tech, I think you, think you were down to three or four brothers. And Brett Hardy, one man, a former member of the High Council, made a big difference. Goals, people who set, people who are driven to set uh, lofty goals and usually commit themselves beyond their natural ability. And I think that's kind of what Jerry was talking about. You know, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Um, you know, I'm an, I'm an average guy. I was an average student. I came from an average family, um, you know, but I just went for it. And I think goal setting is really important. Uh, the reason people don't set goals, I think mainly, is fear. And I <laughs> fear that they'll fail. And the reason you don't write things down, the reason you don't show, often show your goals to other people is for fear of failure. I call fear feelings and emotions that appear real. It's like you went to MSU, you're making stuff up, and that's what you do. You make stuff up, and you create these imaginary obstacles, so try to let those go.